My name is James Moore. I'm an adjunct professor of political economy at Golden Gate University. I'm also a senior instructor at Test Magic, which is a test preparation and admissions advisory service based in San Francisco. We have offices in San Francisco, Millbrae, and we'll be opening soon in Sunnyvale. And today I'm going to talk to you a bit about the admissions process as a whole, and specifically some of the changes that have gone on around what's called the common application. And because I'm an economist, I'm going to do some statistics. I'm sorry. I'll make them less than boring, okay? <laughs> but I think numbers, which are a big part of the admissions game, need to be understood fully. And as a parent myself of two children, not quite as far along as yours are, but one who's thinking constantly about school and getting my kid into the best school and what that means, um, I believe strongly that these numbers will give us some information about how we strategize, okay? Um, so let me start. Let me just give you a little bit of background about Test Magic itself. Test Magic is a 14-year-old institution started in 1998, so almost 15 now, by a gentleman named Aaron Billy. And it was based originally around the idea of providing preparatory um, exam, or exam prep for standardized tests, SAT, ACT, and then some of the more advanced tests for uh, graduate school. And the organization was joined by Ivy Ng, who is right, right there. And she brought a new perspective because she came on board uh, as someone trying to help her brother navigate the admissions process into uh, U.S. University. And as an international student, as someone who did not master the English language completely, she ran into a number of hurdles and difficulties. And she realized that this is the kind of thing that we all need as parents, brothers and sisters, in helping out those people that we want to get the best education possible for. And so we begin to shift the orientation of the organization towards trying to provide a more comprehensive set of services that help students and their parents navigate this crazy world called admissions, right? And we've been a blessed organization because we have had an amazing group of teachers come through our doors who have taught and are to teach for us now from all the top institutions. So not only are these people incredibly gifted at what they teach, but they know the admissions process. They went through it as a graduate from MIT, or as a graduate from Harvard, or as a graduate from Berkeley. And so they bring that, that additional understanding to the whole process. Um, this is a listing of what we do provide now as a service. SAT prep, we do subject tutoring, we do homework tutoring, and of course we do college applications admissions. And uh, we're happy to talk to you at a greater length. I don't want to spend too much time selling you test magic. I want to give you guys some information that's useful, okay? Which, yeah. So, we're going to talk about the admissions, uh, admissions process. And like I said, I want to talk about some of the data that we look at admissions. We hear a lot of things. Harvard lets in 5.7% of its applicants, right? If you apply early decision, you have a better chance. Only one in 10 of people who are deferred get into the school that they apply to. And all these numbers are real. The data is out there. But you need to look behind it to really understand what it means as someone who's trying to help their child apply to a school, okay? Talk a bit about roadblocks, and some roadblocks that are specific to this community here, okay? And then we'll talk a bit about ways you can get around those or better perform, okay? So. Let's start off with what an admissions officer is looking for. You are an admissions officer at Yale, and you want three things in your, in your class, right? The first thing is you want to fill all the admission slots with top candidates. And the top candidates have to be, one, they have to be academically capable. And we all understand what that means, right? They have to be able to do the work that a university of that caliber requires. And the only measurement that they're going to use for that is what that student's GPA is, and the type of courses that they took. Because that directly translates, the correlation is incredibly strong between how well a student does in top tier, top level classes in their high school in comparison to how well they do in college, okay? The second thing we're gonna look at is unique talents. Now, when we say that word, the first thing that comes to my mind is someone like Yo-Yo Ma and his ability on the cello. And I wish my daughter could play cello like that, she doesn't. Or I think of Michael Phelps and the way that man moves through the water. And I wish my daughter could do that, and she might, because she's quite a good swimmer. But the simple fact is that unique talents cover an enormous range of things. They can be exceptionally good at piano, but they could also be exceptionally good at public speaking. They could be exceptionally good at quantum physics, but they could also be exceptionally good at standing on a stage and acting out Shakespeare. But the most important thing for you as parents, and for those of you who are students here, is you want to uh, pursue something unique that you 
love. You need to, as a parent, encourage. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar, there's a very famous book called The, the, uh, the Battle Hymn of the Tiger Moth by a woman named Amy Chua, an impressive woman. And the book is fantastic. And it's a somewhat controversial thesis, but it's worthwhile reading. And I agree with it, a lot of, her, a lot of the, the arguments she makes, but she makes one case I don't agree with. She had a rule for her two daughters who have performed spectacularly academically. And her rule was her child can only play one of two instruments, piano or violin. There are no extra after school uh, uh, sports. There are no after school activities that don't involve piano or violin. They're non-academic. So no plays, no clubs, none of that. I'm going to tell you right now, admissions officers want that. And they want to see activities that show that the student was involved. If your kid plays soccer and is good and loves it, encourage him or her. Right? If they swim, encourage him or her. If they play chess, encourage him or her. It does not matter. But have them do something that they love. That's the unique talent. And the last thing is diversity. And there's not much we can do about that, right? Our children are who they are. But I want to make sure that you understand the word diversity does not necessarily mean that I am Caucasian and the bulk of this audience is Asian. It means race. It means gender. It means whether or not your parents, that's us, went to school. And not just if we went to that school so that our child would go to the same school, it's if we went to school at all. In fact, one of the strongest correlations now between admissions into a top universities is if your parents did not attend college. Isn't that interesting? So if you have parents who did not make that, get that opportunity, they want to give those kids an opportunity. And if they show promise in these other areas, that's considered diversity too. Because you come from a different place. It's socioeconomic, right? So all of these play out in what an admissions officer is looking for to bring in what they want as a comprehensive and inclusive admitted class. All right, so what's it take? We all know the story, right? It takes high GPA and rigorous classes. It takes exceptionally high scores in the SAT and ACT. It takes imagining extracurricular talent. And what it really takes, which a lot of us don't spend as much time with, is this one right here. It takes amazing personal statements. And this is the whole essay thing that we'll spend some time with. How many of you guys like writing essays? Or like writing essays? You do? That's good. I love writing. I'm lucky enough since I get paid to write for some cases. But writing is hard. And writing well is really hard. And writing about yourself well has got to be one of the hardest things in the world. Because when you ask, I have students all the time, I come to them and I say, let's write about an interesting story about you. And they go, oh, my life's boring. I do the same things my friends do. And it's true. They do. But they do a ton of things that they don't realize are incredibly interesting. And oftentimes it takes someone outside of their life. Not their parents, but someone outside who can sit back and say, oh, that's a story. And that's a story you should tell. And helping them to tell that story is critical. All right? Now, diversity of backgrounds, again, just knowing where you are and knowing the story of the family and knowing where this person came from is also important. And finally, with private universities, and we'll talk a little bit about that, um, nearly all the major <coughs> private universities, and certainly all of those in the Ivy League, set up interviews with prospective students. And that doesn't mean you have to fly off to Penn, or to Harvard, or to Yale. It means that the alumni associations here, and you know that the Bay Area has very strong ones amongst all the top universities. They have a lot of alumnus interviews. And we've had a number of alum working for us, and they have said, many of these have been on these, these committees, and they've said time and time again, we're looking for that kid that loves something and pursues it, and pursues it with vigor and desire and passion and has done it over time and has all these other components. Because you guys know, there are lots of kids out there that are 4-0 and higher. There are lots of kids out there that can score higher than 2,000, higher than 2,200 in the SAT. Stanford and Harvard <coughs> regularly reject, half the students they reject are valedictorians of their high school. Best in their high school, they reject them. And it's not because they're not candidates, it's because that whole package, that holistic approach is really critical for them. And that's when you encourage your kids to stand out. Because we all have sort of a unique story to tell, and we can tell that story in ways that we probably don't realize, right? So I'm going to push on that. Um, all right. So the mechanics of admissions itself. Admitting to a school, particularly the Ivy League, they use a thing called the academic index. And the academic index is, a, is a, essentially a mathematical equation. It's made up of your test scores on your SAT or ACT, your class ranking, and a little bit of mathematics. And we're happy to go into the whole process of this, but this is used by most of the major schools. What's really tricky is this guy right here, the converted rank score. And this is the thing. How many of you guys right now, how many of you guys can raise your hand and tell me that you know A, where your child ranks in her or his particular class, and B, how you know that. 
So is your class number child number one in that class, number five, number 50? Does anyone here know that? Okay, that's a fair question. You want to find out if you can ask, get that information. Schools report this information. Universities use it to create this thing called the converted rank score. They go out to that school and they say, we think Jane is a great candidate. And we see Jane is a 3.4, but how does she register to her peers in your class? Is she the fifth best student? Is she the 20th best student? And how your high school reports that information has bearing on where your student gets ranked. Some schools will give the exact number. Right? Some students, they'll say, your kid is number five out of 350 people in the class. Some will just give a percentile. Your child's in the top 20 percentile. The top 10 percentile. Right? Some will not report that information at all. They just get the GPA. And if they do this, the school uses that information. I can tell you now that if your child is in the top 10%, but at the bottom bracket, you do well if that school only reports in the percentile. Because the, uh, the school who's looking at your child will suddenly rate that person as 95th, no matter what. Because they don't know. They give the 10%, so they say you're 95. So it penalizes super top students. If you're the number one, two, three, four, or five, you're still considered the 95th percentile. But if you're 28, 29, 30, you get a bump up. All right? The second thing it does is it penalizes you if the school is small. If I'm at the top of my class, but my class peers make up only 30 people, and I'm the number one student there, that is worth less than if I am number five in a class of 300 people. All right? And this matters because these little bits can bump you into admissions or non admissions. So need the first thing I say is no. Talk to your school counselor. How do you guys rank students and how do you report? Know what the class number is. Now in some cases we send our kids because the schools, the local schools are great school and that's work. That work works for us. But there's always been this idea that going to small teeny private schools are great. But the problem with small teeny private schools is that your number comes in lower here even if you perform really well. Alright, so I want you guys to consider these are some of the mechanics of how the uh, admissions work. Okay. It's not the only part of the process, but it's a big part. Okay. All right. So now I'm going to scare you guys, and I know you've all seen these numbers. This listing of top schools admissions over the last five years. And I'll just show you one thing: every one of these trend line is going in the wrong direction. Right? Every one of them. Now there are little blips here and there, but if you go back 15, 20 years, it gets even more dramatic. Right? I read a really interesting article. It was 1956, Yale let in 74% of its admissions, or its applicants. 74%! I want those odds. Right? Last year, Yale let in 6.13 of them. Alright? It's changed. And the biggest issue driving this now is not the caliber of students. There have always been tons of pre caliber students. It's not the numerator in that equation, it's the denominator. The number of students applying now.